So I'm reading about some recent muon particle physics experiments when I run across a reference to the statistical significance of the anomaly under study. Often, this kind of result is accompanied by a somewhat vague but impressive sounding explanatory statement. Yep, there it is. The chance that the results are a statistical fluctuation is about 1 in 40,000. Okay, but how am I even supposed to interpret this statement? I mean, my first instinct is that this is pretty strong evidence, right? But how can I make that impression more precise? Really, whenever I see the results of an experiment with a lot of statistics behind it, what I want to know in order to satisfy my natural skepticism is this. What's the probability, here denoted PR, that nothing interesting is going on and this result is a fluke, given the evidence provided by these new measurements? This situation, in which we're just fooling ourselves by seeing patterns in the noise, is also called the null hypothesis, because it proposes that any underlying effect size is actually zero, or null, basically saying there's no there there. It's given the symbol H0 as a convenient shorthand. Now, is that the 1 in 40,000 number being quoted here? Because if so, I can rest easy that the chances of this result actually representing an interesting deviation from the norm would be in excess of 99.99%. But wait a second, they talk about 1 in 40,000 as being the significance level. Oh no, that sounds like a p-value. I'm going to have to think about this a little more deeply, because the meaning of a p-value is kind of like the opposite of what I've written down here. It's saying that if we presume there's nothing interesting going on beyond the usual statistical fluctuations, in other words, the null hypothesis is true, and we just have a distribution of possible outcomes because our measurement is noisy, then the chances of getting a result like this one, something that's at least as unusual as this measurement outcome, is 1 in 40,000. Well, that's clearly related to what I want to know. After all, the more unusual looking a result, the more confident I should feel that something truly unusual is actually the cause. But at the same time, the two concepts aren't exactly identical, are they? For instance, the probability of a raven being black, in other words, the probability that a bird is black, given that we already know it's a raven, is much higher than the probability of a randomly chosen black bird turning out to be a raven. So how do I go from the information contained in the p-value the probability of getting a result like this one, under the assumption that there's no real good reason for it, to its converse, the thing I really want to know, which is the probability that this result is just a kind of false alarm, given the unusual measurements that have been obtained. Dealing with these different but related conditional probabilities kind of makes me think I'm going to have to look up Bayes' rule again, but that sounds like work. There's got to be a way to think about this that avoids doing all that work. I know, I'll make a diagram going through all the ways to arrange these probabilities. So if this were something like a medical screening or a classification problem, I'd start by considering the whole population and then break it up into multiple groups based on the test results. Here though, the population is something a bit more ill-defined, maybe something like the space of all the possible results we could get when doing a measurement like this one in all possible worlds. I'll go with that for now and see if it still makes sense later. In any case, we can conceptually break this population up into two groups, the worlds in which we get results at least as unusual as the ones we got, and the worlds in which the results of this measurement look more ordinary. Let's see. I want to talk about the likelihood of finding myself in one or the other of these two groups, so let's call this one the probability of u for the chances of getting such an unusual result, which makes the probability of the second complementary branch 1 minus the first, or probability of not u. Incidentally, I've always liked how similar the word probability is to both proportion, as in the proportion of worlds in which the data look a certain way, and propensity, as in the inherent propensity of the measurement to return a result like this one. Weirdly enough, the three words are not especially closely related, so it's just a happy accident that you can pick whichever one makes sense for you for the standard abbreviation PR. Alright, 
Let's consider the worlds that give us an unusual result. These we can split again into two groups, those in which there's nothing really going on and this result is a fluke, also known as a false positive in some contexts, and those in which there's really a good reason for getting such an unusual result, a true positive. Here's where the conditional probabilities come in. Since we're already operating under the assumption that we got unusual data, the proportion of these worlds that are false positives is denoted by a conditional, the probability of the null hypothesis, H0, given the unusual result. So this is ultimately what I want to know. What's the probability that the real explanation is just that this is a fluke, even though we got such unusual looking data? The complement is then the probability that the null hypothesis is not true. There's really something going on, and the result isn't a fluke, given the unusual data. What about this other branch of the diagram? Here are all the possible worlds that wouldn't have given us such unusual data. And we can similarly break them up into worlds in which the null hypothesis is true, which makes sense if the measurement result is boring, so these are the true negatives and worlds in which the null hypothesis is false, and there really is something interesting going on, but we just didn't pick up on it, so these are the false negatives. I'm using the terms positive and negative in the sense of medical testing, or binary classification. A positive means we detected something, and a negative means we didn't detect anything. So, if we have a true positive, there was something to detect, and we really detected it, while a false positive means there wasn't anything to detect, but we detected something anyway. A true negative refers to the situation where there wasn't anything to detect, and so we didn't detect anything, while a false negative means there was something to detect, but we missed it. That covers all the possible outcomes, but unfortunately, now I'm a bit stuck. I've identified what I want to know, this probability of a result as unusual as the one we got, leading to a false alarm, but I have no way to relate it back to what they actually gave us. It's converse, the p-value. Hmm, maybe this was the wrong approach. Is there another way to break up this problem? Well, since the p-value is just like this conditional probability, only in the opposite direction, what if I stick with the tree diagram, but do it in a different order? Instead of breaking up the population based on the different measurement results, let's first break it up based on the different hypothesis assumptions. Okay, starting over. Branch, more different branch. This one will represent the worlds in which the null hypothesis is true, there's nothing interesting going on, move along. This one will represent the worlds in which the null hypothesis is false, and there's a real effect just begging to be detected. Now, let's split these groups up by the results of our measurement. For this group, we just have random statistical fluctuation, but some of the time, we get an unusual looking result anyway. This is what leads to a false positive. So that happens with the probability of the unusual looking data, given the null hypothesis is true. On the other hand, if we hadn't noticed anything unusual in the data, that would be for the best, since there's nothing going on under the hood in which case we'd have a true negative. The chances of this are the probability of not you, given the null hypothesis being true. Filling out the rest of our tree, we can also split up the worlds in which there's a real effect to uncover, where the null hypothesis is false, into those in which we succeeded in detecting an anomaly, the true positives, according to the probability of you given a false null hypothesis, and those in which we didn't succeed in measuring anything unusual, the false negatives, according to the probability of not you, given a false null hypothesis. So this is interesting. One of the terms in this diagram corresponds exactly to our p-value, the probability of getting such an unusual looking result if the null hypothesis were true, and it's all just due to random noise. For the case of the muon experiment, this is what the study determined was 1 in 40,000. How can I relate this to what I want to know, the probability that nothing's really going on despite getting such unusual data, as shown in the first tree diagram? Well, in both diagrams, these probabilities relate to the number of false positives. It shouldn't matter if I start with the worlds that give us unusual looking data and select the proportion of those where the null hypothesis is true, as in the upper diagram, 
or if I start with the worlds where the null hypothesis is true and select the proportion of those where the measurement gives us unusual looking data, as in the lower diagram. The number of false positives is the same either way. Maybe I can use that to relate the two. Okay, let's make some room here. If I start at the root of one of these diagrams, then each branch of probability represents the proportion of the cases I started with that belong to the next group. So, here in the first diagram, I can take our original population of measurements, let's say its size is n, multiply by the probability of u to get the number of outcomes showing unusual results, and multiply by the probability of h not given u to get the number of false positives. In the second diagram, I can start with the same population n, multiply by the probability of h not to get the number of situations in which the null hypothesis is true, and multiply by the probability of u given h not to get the number of times we'd get a false positive. But this is just the same thing, the total number of cases in which a false positive occurs, calculated two different ways. So I can just equate the two. Canceling the original population size n, which was just an arbitrary placeholder for all the possible ways our measurement could have turned out under Endy's set of hypotheses to begin with, I'm left with an expression that might look somewhat familiar to anyone who's done some probability or statistics. Isolating the term that I originally wanted to derive, the probability of h not given u, leaves this expression for the likelihood of having a false alarm given the measurement outcome. I guess I couldn't avoid it after all. This is just the much discussed Bayes rule, saying that if we want to get the probability of a hypothesis h not given the unusual data u, I guess I can call that the posterior probability to use the standard jargon, we can take the probability of our hypothesis prior to getting the unusual looking data and multiply that by the amount of support that our hypothesis h not would lend such data, as given by the p-value relative to the unconditional probability of u, which is the likelihood of getting a result at least that unusual in the first place, without specifying a hypothesis. In practice, this unconditional probability of getting an unusual looking result, the probability of u, can also be expressed in terms of the other probabilities on the tree diagram by following a similar procedure. The proportion of all measurement outcomes that show such unusual data is simply the sum of all these situations with a positive result. The proportion of false positives, which can be obtained from the lower diagram by multiplying the relevant two probability terms in subsequent branches, plus the proportion of true positives, obtained from the lower diagram by multiplying a different pair of probability terms in subsequent branches. This is sometimes called the law of total probability, but again, just like Bayes' rule, it can be read directly off of the tree diagram. No memorization needed, which is good, because I'd never be able to keep track of all of these different conditionals otherwise. So with this substitution, the formula looks a little more complicated, but the advantage is, now it's made up of elements that all depend only on the null hypothesis or its complement as the conditional statement, rather than relying on assumptions about the somewhat inscrutable probability of u alone. The p-value, which we already know, shows up twice, the prior probability, or its complement, shows up three times, and wait a second, what's this final term in the denominator? Well, it seems somewhat similar to the p-value because it's the probability of getting data at least as unusual as the data we got, but this time it's conditional on the null hypothesis not being true. In other words, it's the probability of detecting an unusual looking result when there really is an interesting underlying effect to detect. So I'm going to call that the sensitivity of this measurement, to borrow a term from medical screening for a similar concept, since it captures how sensitive the measurement is to the presence of an anomaly. When I first ran across this sensitivity term, I assumed it was the same thing as the statistical power, but I've since come to realize that there is a subtle difference. Power is usually calculated in advance of seeing any data to make sure that the study's sample size is sufficient to detect the effect size that is of interest. Well, the sensitivity here is dependent on the actual measurement outcome obtained. 
Still, like the power, it is conditioned on the null hypothesis being false, so a higher power study should be more sensitive as well. And it's in the denominator here, because the higher the sensitivity of this test, meaning the more likely it is that a true anomaly will produce unusual looking data, the lower the posterior probability that this was all just a fluke. Yeah, that holds together. Well, this is all great, but all they gave me was the p-value, 1 in 40,000. I'd really like it if they had told me the study's power as well. After all, for a power of zero, the sensitivity would be zero. Everything would just cancel out, and we'd be left with a posterior probability of one. In other words, absolute certainty that this result was a fluke, no matter what the p-value is. For higher power tests, the denominator will always be larger than the numerator, so at least then we get a sensible posterior probability, which does indeed get smaller for lower p-values, as I'd expect. Let's see. In that case, if I reduce the denominator slightly by neglecting the relatively small first term, I can even find an upper bound for the posterior probability. That also happens to be a pretty decent approximation to it at least for p-values much lower than the sensitivity. So this is telling me that if I want to guarantee a low posterior probability of this result being just a fluke, I should make sure both that the p-value is low and that the power is high. But even then, it still depends quite a bit on what the prior probability of the null hypothesis is. And unfortunately, that's not something that this experiment can tell us. For that, I have to decide for myself how likely I think it is, before seeing the new data, that the null hypothesis of nothing interesting going on is true. For instance, I might have pretty high confidence in the standard model of particle physics to begin with, given its excellent track record of experimental predictions, leading to a correspondingly high prior for the truth of the null hypothesis in any particle physics experiment designed to look for deviations from the standard model. On the other hand, if perhaps I've heard that there is some uncertainty about the right way to calculate the standard model's predictions for the muon g-2 experiment, that might reduce my prior confidence in the null hypothesis, which then also reduces my posterior probability that this is a statistical fluke, and hence increases my confidence that this measurement result represents a real difference from the original prediction. Wow, no wonder study authors never attempt to calculate this type of probability for the reader even if it's ultimately what every reader wants to know. Different readers may very well approach this study with quite different priors, not to mention differing interpretations of what the prior probability even represents, depending on whether they prefer a Bayesian or frequentist approach. But I think that's a discussion for another time. For now, I'll just try to remember that a p-value isn't enough to tell me exactly what I want to know about the likelihood that a given result is really just a false alarm due to the noise. It can only tell me the opposite, saying, if nothing out of the ordinary were going on, how often we'd expect to see results like this one. But, taken as a fraction of the sensitivity, the p-value can tell me how much I should adjust my previous expectations in light of the new evidence. That may be a bit convoluted, but the p-value is still the best statistical information a study's authors can objectively provide on how surprising this result is. Ultimately then, it's up to us, the readers, to understand what that means and interpret it correctly. Well, along with the popular science writers and press release authors, who really should try to avoid oversimplifying what a p-value represents by only describing it as the chances of a statistical fluctuation. Just saying.